Hey Eric, thanks for uh, coming to Mid-America Flight Museum. I uh, appreciate you being here and, and filming this walk around of one of our most historic airplanes we actually have in our museum is our uh, Ford 4AT tri-motor. Uh, this particular aircraft was built in uh, 1929. It's serial number 55 out of 199 total that were built. Uh, Ford is one of those airplanes that really was a turning point in aviation. Uh, you know, we, we started flying in 1903 Wright Brothers, but we couldn't quite get it figured out until the till till around 1909 or 1910, and uh, World War One came. And but but aviation really wasn't open to the public for a long time. Even though we went through World War One and those fighters, the public really couldn't unless you were one of the barnstormers, one of the early uh, pioneer aviators. You really didn't get to participate in it until we got into the mid 1920s. Then we started having some airplanes like our Waco 9 that you've looked at before. They were actually available to the public, but you couldn't go anywhere with them. So the Ford Tri-Motor was truly one of the absolute first uh, aircraft that was used in uh, airline service. Uh, we've got a Travel Air uh, 6000 back there that was that was used a single engine, but the public really wouldn't buy getting on an airplane with just one motor. So um, uh, uh, it's kind of funny, the history, there was 20 investors that put in a thousand dollars each uh, to form uh, the uh, Stout Aircraft Company that that Ford ended up acquiring and, and, and when he went to Ford he told him one of the stories was I guarantee you won't get your money back but we're going to pioneer something in aviation. He had this idea for this public transport aircraft and you know like any other venture they, they started the, the AT-3 and it was kind of a dismal failure never had enough horsepower but then they ended up here the AT-4 this is an AT-4 and then an AT-5. And those are the two airplanes that they built 199 of total. And it changed the world because I believe I've read that in 1930, if you were flying on an aircraft, there was a, around a 90% chance you were in a Ford Tri-Motor. That's, that's how it dominated the skies. Yet in about 1934, it was an obsolete aircraft because now we had the DC-2, had the Boeing 247, we had some amazing airplanes that would go further, faster, higher than this. But I, I've said this all along and I've never read this, so this is, a, this is my statement. I believe this is truly the first antique classic aircraft ever in the history of American aviation because it was so important to our aviation history, yet five, eight, ten years after it was built, it was completely obsolete, but people recognized how important uh, this aircraft was. All metal construction, corrugated aluminum, people come in and say, I wonder why they use this corrugated aluminum. I said, well, look at the airplane hangers we have today. They're corrugated. It provided strength. So it was an all metal aircraft. Um, it wasn't necessarily revolutionary. There were other completely all metal aircraft, but this is, a first, this is the first one ever put into this type of production. Never had a structural failure of a Ford Tri-Motor. For those of you watching this, if you want to entertain yourself, go just Google or go to YouTube and Google Ford tri-motor acrobatics. Yes, I said it right. And there was a guy named Johnson that flew these things in shows all across America and he did an acrobatic routine on the deck that will just put the hair up on your uh, on your arms. That particular airplane happens to be, uh, I believe, down in Palestine, Texas. Another person that he bought that aircraft from Greg Herrick. There's a total of eight flyable uh, four tri-motors that are, that are registered in the United States. So this is one of eight. I think there's 15, 18 airframes. I don't count the one like in the Smithsonian that would never fly again. But there's eight of these things out there that are, that are flyable. This particular airplane was uh, delivered in 1929 to a uh, flying service in Spokane, Washington called Marmar Flying Service. They bought three of these aircraft and uh, I think they ended up crashing two of them and this one, uh, this one made it and it, it hauled mail and it, it did charter, it did everything that it could possibly do to, um, to, uh, to facilitate that flying services business in Spokane, Washington. Uh, it went on to fly for KT Flying Service in uh, Hawaii. And so kind of a neat thing, part of its history is uh, this is one of four aircraft uh, flying in the world today that we know of that flew uh, uh, at Pearl Harbor December 7, 1941. This is a flying aircraft there and it's, it's back. 
uh, story goes that it got strafed there, but there's absolutely no documentation to back that up. It wouldn't surprise me at all because the Japanese were strafing anything they could find that would possibly fly. So I don't know its history, but it was at Pearl as an island hopper. Uh, it came back, it went to Johnson Flying Service, and Johnson was a very innovative company in Missoula, Montana, and they birthed an industry smoke jumpers. So firefighters with parachutes would jump in ahead of a fire and try to get it stopped. And this particular serial number, I believe, is the first uh, aircraft to ever have a water tank in it to bomb a forest fire. And just a little bit about the airplane in particular, it, its gross weight on this particular one is 10,300 pounds. So it's a pretty good sized airplane. It's powered by uh, three Wright uh, R975 engines that are putting out 440 horsepower. Uh, our Travel Air uh, 6000 has the identical engine on it. Uh, forward exhaust. Uh, one thing that's unique about a Ford Trimotor, we'll, we'll go inside here in a little bit, when you look at the cockpit, all of the engine instruments you see are just for the center engine. So you look at that, there, where are the other RPM gauges and stuff. You look out here on the pylon, and there is your uh, RPM and your uh, oil temperature and your oil pressure gauges. And it's funny, it's actually fairly visible from the, uh, from the pilot's seat there. Very robust landing gear, uh, shock absorbing uh, system here. Of the eight flyable uh, Ford Tri-Motors, I'm pretty sure we are the only one that had the original 1927 wheels and brakes. And to me, that's probably the weak link of our aircraft. Uh, it's got a Johnson bar braking system in there. there. There are two master cylinders in there, so when you pull back on the handle, pull straight back, you get brakes on both sides. And pull to the right, uh, you'll get brake on the right, and to the left, brake on the left. It's pretty a uh, pr pretty ingenious system. It's a hydraulic braking system, and I tell people the brakes are adequate. So you certainly never use them on the runway. You know, if you were getting away from it, they're not going to do you any good. They're really used really for taxiing around. The aircraft's very very easy to fly, but it's actually a little bit of a challenge to fly. Uh, what little time I have in it, in certainly in taxiing in a crosswind, is where you have to use a differential power, and then hopefully you got somebody in the right seat. It doesn't have to be a pilot, but somebody that can just help you with the braking system. The controls, for the most part, are external. Uh, they go through a pulley system to go back to the tail, but it's a very easy aircraft to pre-flight. Uh, all the skins on this particular airplane were put on new in 2000, I believe in five, and if you look, the die from the printing is still on these skins. Uh, we could take some uh, MEK and get that off. So it's been washed, but it's never been really, really cleaned since then. So it's got all brand new skins, and when I bought the airplane, uh, from uh, Ron Pratt in Arizona, the engines last had been overhauled in 19, I believe, 55 or 56. So, and they had like 55 hours on it. So, again, once the airplane went obsolete, it went straight into museum to museum to museum. They weren't really flown very much. And I told my guys that if we get home with two good running engines, I'll be happy. So, they are all turning, but one had metal in it and one had some broke springs in it. So we, uh, we ordered uh, three new engines from Radial Engines Limited. Uh, Caleb and his dad, they built us up some engines. Took about a year to get them here. We put them, put them on and we've got some uh, great engines. These are, as you can see, they're ground adjustable, but they're, uh, they're basically fixed pitch props. So they're non-feathering fixed pitch props. Uh, if you lose the front engine, it actually flies pretty well. If you lose one of the side engines, it takes pretty much everything you got on the front and the other engine to, uh, to, keep, it, to keep it in the air. But uh, front engine failure is really not that big a deal. But, you know, like a lot of these piston engine airplanes, you lose an engine, uh, I wouldn't go very far cross country. I would get the first available place to put it down and land safely. And uh, in that regard, it was pretty, pretty safe, actually. Actually, I'm going to, while you're going around this, I'm going to show you this just because I think some people may be interested in seeing how this braking system works. If you can get in here and look. So we have uh, these master cylinders right here set at a, more than a 45 degree angle. And here's your bar coming down. So when we look at that here in a minute, when you pull the bar straight back, it pushes both these cylinders in and you get braking to uh, both wheels. Or you can angle it and go one or the other. Uh, this is actually uh, right brake and that's left brake because of the the uh, the, the re reverse direction of the uh, of the handle. It's a very clean airplane, as you can see up in there. It was completely restored again, 2005, and now then we've got all brand new engines. So it's it's amongst 
there are no really bad tri-motors out there. Everybody's pretty much uh, put some time, money, and effort in them. The EAAs flies probably the most. They fly their airplane a lot and hop a lot of rides. It's a very dependable aircraft. And uh, we pull this one out fairly regular and, and fly it. Got the original end number on it, NC9612. It's painted to represent a transcontinental air tr uh, transport company, which was the first transcontinental airline service uh, flown by a Ford Tri-Motor. This serial number didn't fly that. This is the way this one's painted to represent, but it would basically, you could get from New York to Los Angeles. And it was a combination of flying on aircraft and trains to get you to, uh, to Los Angeles. But think about it, if you lived in New York in the 1920s, how do you get to LA? It was, it was a long run, it was a long ride to, uh, to figure out how to get there on those dirt roads. So this was kind of the beginning uh, of that. It's got a very long, uh, very long tail. It's got a 75, I can't remember how long it is. It's a 74 foot wing, so it's a pretty good sized wing. Uh, but a very uh, long arm tail, so it's very good directional control on takeoff and landing. A big old rudder out here, it doesn't take much wind uh, headwind at all on this and then you have very good directional control going down the uh, going down the runway. I don't know if these will show up but uh, when they restored it there were some of the people who probably worked on it back in the uh, in the 30s they scraped their names in this metal and there are several places that have actually dates in it and when they restored it they didn't they didn't change any of that. I really really appreciate them not uh, getting rid of that that little bit of history, I thought that was pretty interesting. Right side's just identical to the left side. Again, never a structural failure in a Ford Tri-Motor. No ADs on it to this date. So it's pretty amazing, a pretty amazing airplane. The ailerons on it, I've never had an airplane or flown an aircraft that you could demonstrate the effects of adverse yaw more so than a Ford Tri-Motor. You turn the wheel to the right and the nose just goes to the left a long way, like 25 degrees, and then finally it slops around and it'll start a, and it'll start a turn. So it's, uh, it, it's really a, an airplane you have to understand what adverse yaw is and, and what effects that has on an aircraft to really effectively fly, especially in a crosswind. But uh, that's pretty much it from the, from the outside, and uh, if you want to take a, take a step in, we'll go inside and, uh, and take a look at the, uh, the airplane, Eric. So watch your head, there are a couple bulkheads. It's like kind of getting into a submarine with these uh, bulkheads you got in here. So you got nine passenger seats right here and you actually do have a, uh, you do have a toilet in the back. So this would have been a uh, pretty much a, uh, a configuration you would have had back in the day. Uh, no baggage in this one to speak of except some overhead bins you could throw some, some things in. The 5AT, the little bit larger aircraft, is almost no bigger on the inside that I, I've, I've gotten up in one. I haven't gotten the tape measure and checked it. But the biggest thing it's got is got baggage out in the wing, outboard of the, uh, the engines, just like what you would get in your attic with. Uh, uh, it, would, it would hinge down and it would hold quite a few bags. That, the, the cord of this aircraft is very, very big. And so they utilize that space on the five to put baggage on both sides. Uh, I'll pop this open. I'd like you just to you might need a little bit of light, but I think you can get the I think you can get the idea here just how nice the airplane is. It's beautifully restored. Everything's zinc chromated and painted. We got a hundred gallon tank there. We've got another hundred gallon tank over on the other side, and we got a fifty gallon tank right in the center. So. It's kind of a kind of an interesting uh, fuel tank. There's the center tank right there. Uh, if you turn around right there, you can see that center tank. We'll get up here in the uh, the cockpit and show you a few unique things about the uh, about the airplane. big control wheels and one thing I want to point out to you uh, they turn a long way 
So tremendous amount of turn. The forward emblem right there on the top so you know you're at the center position because it's real easy to take off right there if you don't look out. So you know that's the uh, the center position. Uh, one, the, one of the, it's, it's a very easy airplane to fly, but it, it's really fun to get it lit off and started. So here's our primer over here. So we've got a left and you can pull your primer out and you can pump fuel into the left engine, the center, and the right and then back to off so you can get the airplane completely primed. We do have a battery in here so we, and then we've got uh, external power and we've got a regular battery and then down here on the bottom you've got three uh, foot pedals probably dimmer switches off of a Ford I, I guess and you push down either one of these these are all inertial starters so you push it down and it winds up probably about 30 seconds when it winds up your outboards we have an electric solenoid switch right here that once we get it completely wound up, we let off of it and we reach over and go to the left or the right and that engages the starter and then it starts uh, spinning. And you've got quite a few blades on there before your inertial completely goes down. And after you've gotten through a few blades, you turn on your magnetos and it'll pop off. Your center engine, you do the same thing, but then you have it just like in, in some of the older uh, uh, single engine aircraft, you've got a pull handle to pull it to uh, engage the starter, but you do it, use an electrical solenoid to get the uh, left and the right. So we've got our three throttles right there, and then we've got our three magnetos. Then underneath here is our, is our three, mi three mixture controls. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, big old compass, um, uh, just a just pretty amazing airplane. The, the fuel system is kind of neat. Everything feeds into a pipe, a center pipe. So I can feed the right tank or the left tank. And here's, here's our little directions right here. And the previous guy that I bought it from did this right here. So the way we want to normally run is we put the green arrows here, here, and here. And there's three valves behind my head. And we, we flip this thing around and we make sure the valves are in the right position. So it's a really good uh, checklist item. Uh, uh, to, uh, but, but we can basically run any engine off of any tank. And we can isolate any tank or any engine. But um, you really don't feed from the tank exactly. You feed from a pipe that, uh, that the tanks feed. And it's, it's kind of a really unique uh, fuel system. But once you kind of figure it out, you look at it and you say, well, that makes perfect sense. Um, master cylinders are right behind here on each. Um, it's kind of hard to get around there. But there is a, uh, this is where we would fill our brake reservoir. We have a left and a right. And it's a kind of unique system. You open it up, you fill it up, you get your brakes pumped and bled. Then you shut that back down and it's a needle valve. So basically, that's just a reservoir that feeds your brake master cylinder. So if I open that valve and I hit the brake, you would push all the, all the fluid back up into the reserve tank. So again, you kind of just got to know the system, but it's, it's not very difficult at all. Here's that Johnson brake that we were talking about. I guess you like the name of that, don't you? Yes. Eric, Eric <laughs> Johnson. So here, here it is. And so you pull straight back on it. And that engages both master cylinders and you get braking to both wheels. So typically at the pilot, I'm over in the left seat, I would, I would make all the left turns. So I would pull back and left because it's real easy to pull. It's really hard to pull this way. So if I'm making a right turn, I'd ask whoever's over here to help me pull that over here. And of course, at that point in time, we're trying to use as much differential power as possible. It's just an absolute hoot to taxi. And it's, it's frustrating and it's a lot of fun. And, uh, but that's the kind of the unique thing about the uh, Ford Tri-Motor. <clears throat> I know what the book says on speeds. It goes a lot faster than it says it will go. But in reality, we don't have variable pitch props. And we've got ours set to a more of a climb. This thing will pop off the ground. It's more like a super cub. You give it the power and just pull back on it. And it's climbing. But it doesn't cruise real fast. So I'm sitting there indicating around 90, 95 miles an hour is what it's going to indicate at around 18, 1850 RPMs. But I actually have to pull it back on takeoff. I can't go to full throttle. I'll overspeed it. Probably could put a little bit more uh, pitch in those, uh, those propellers. It, it does take a little getting used to trying to sink it. It's just almost impossible to sink. You set the front engine where you want it, and then the uh, the two outside engines, you sit there and play with them until you get it to where it sounds somewhat. It's kind of loud. So uh, one of the instructors that taught me, again, I don't have much time in them, and there's people watching this who will probably say, oh, everything he's saying is wrong, and that's okay. But uh, one of the techniques was um, 
when you're coming in for landing, turning base, coming into final. Once you've got everything kind of made, uh, we pull back. We'll, we'll have the uh, we'll have the center engine up almost at a cruise, and when we got the runway made, we pull our two outside engines to idle. And the instructor that that showed me that it, it was really really pretty pretty ingenious because it gets rid of all that side load. Um, asymmetrical thrust in case one of them wasn't quite all the way off and one was. Now we just got a single engine center line thrust engine. Now then even with full throttle you're still coming down probably 500 feet a minute on one. Just right down the glide slope. It's really really nice. Uh, one thing about it that's pretty interesting, I've only landed in a strong crosswind one time. It was in Tyler. It was stronger than what I was hoping for and because the other runway was closed but we just used complete differential power and touched down with differential power I used almost no rudder to speak of and it just did great and then chopped the power on the other engines and I came to a, a rolling um, uh, taxi with one engine up at around 12 1300 rpms so it makes really crosswind landings easy and I'm not real good at them but I can see how if you uh, you practice that a little bit it, it would be uh, for people who fly like an EAA I can see how they could get they could get really good flying the airplane uh, Eric that's about it uh, we talk about other things I guess but uh, that's uh, that's the, ma the majority of uh, what I know about the Ford Tri-Motor, you go up right here to, to fuel it and check the oil and everything. You got a little hatch there. Problem is your feet don't go inside this very much, but you're so you're on your toes going up this little ladder and you, you pop it open, you get up there and climb around on the wing and service it and so forth and so on. It's a lot of fun. It, it brings a lot of attention when you fly it into airports. Uh, we did, we mounted our radios right back here. We've got a KY-197 and a, uh, and a transponder here. We're going to go ahead and believe it or not make it ADS-B so we're, we're legal. It's a standard airworthy and a certificated airplane. So we'll go ahead and be able to fly it into Dallas and in places like that. Hope to, hope to come see your business jet here pretty soon. That'd be cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys uh, uh, watching the videos. I appreciate what Eric does. Uh, he, he's done some amazing walk arounds, not only of our airplanes, but a lot of uh, historic airplanes and interviewed some amazing veterans. And it's, uh, it's quite a privilege to be uh, on the other side of the camera with uh, Eric working it. Uh, you do great work. Thank you.